Freddy is back, and he still looks like a slice of pizza. This time, the ghoulish boogeyman of dreams and nightmares is brought back thanks to magical dog piss, where he sets out to finish off the remaining kids of Elm Street once and for all, where he now comes into contact with a new victim called Alice, where he uses her to find more victims and continue his dreamscape killing spree. Because Freddy Krueger is kind of a dick like that. I mean, really, he's not a nice guy at all. Alice must take a stand and face her fears and track Freddy down in the dream world and put a stop to his afterlife antics once and for all in A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, The Dream Master. The 1988 entry, which is often considered at a time when the franchise was at the height of its popularity and success. It's time to get ready with Freddy, as we go back to Elm Street and look into 10 things that you didn't know about A Nightmare on Elm Street for The Dream Master. In today's episode, which is the first Halloween episode of 2022. So, let's check it out. Number 10, A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 could have been a story about time travel. So wanting to capitalise on the success and popularity of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors, in 1987, which was something of a return to form in the series, New Line Cinema didn't waste any time on getting to work on a follow-up, a fourth entry. And of course, they turned to Freddy's daddy himself, Wes Craven, who created A Nightmare on Elm Street, as well as directing the first movie and co-writing the third one. And whenever a new sequel was on the horizon, Craven was kind of the go-to guy to help bring the next nightmare to life. And so Craven wrote a script with writing partner, Bruce Wagner. And, well, the script wasn't exactly what New Line Cinema were looking for, as they probably found it a little too cerebral, and maybe diving too much into science fiction, as it involved time travelling within dreams. And thus, this approach was considered illogical. Even New Line Cinema founder Robert Shea felt that the script was not what they were looking for. So sadly, the time-travelling Freddy Krueger movie never came to be. Number 9. The director really wanted the job. Finnish director Rennie Harlan arrived in Hollywood to further his career. Up until that point, he directed two low-budget movies, those being Born American in 1986 and the other being Prison in 1987. And when Harlan found out about the production of A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and how New Line Cinema was looking for a director, he would frequently arrive at the New Line Cinema offices to offer his services and to pitch himself as the movie's director. But it wasn't exactly love at first sight. Several of the production thought that he seemed smelly and unkept, and he kept turning up in the same clothes suggesting that he was living it pretty rough. Freddy actor Robert Englund described him as a giant Viking with hair down to his ass, and Robert Shea was worried about his lack of being able to speak English. Harlan may not have had a fluent English vocab, or a bar of soap for that matter, but what he did have was passion and determination, where after turning up five times, he was finally appointed as director, where a great deal of the movie's success has been attributed to his directing efforts. And of course, after A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, he would go on to other big projects like Die Hard 2, Cliffhanger, The Long Kiss Goodnight, and Deep Blue Sea. He also directed Cutthroat Island, but you know what they say, nobody's perfect. So they may have gotten a smelly director, but clearly this was a talented director who was a benefit to the production. Even if he probably did need a bar of soap. Number 8. A writer's strike really got in the way of the script writing process. A treatment was written for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 by novelist William Coswinkle, but it definitely needed some work done to it. But what didn't help is that the writing process took place during a writer's strike. Other writers were brought in to polish up the script, like Brian Helgeland, who would actually go on to write LA Confidential and Mystic River, and the writing duo of Ken and Jim Wheat, 
who would go on to write The Fly 2 and Pitch Black. So there was plenty of talent on board, but the writer's strike really got in the way of the movie creatively in the early days of production. Supposedly, filming even started without a completed script. Director Rennie Harlan also added a lot to the script himself, especially the nightmare scenes. In fact, one day the production crew bumped into James Cameron, and he inquired as to how they were going to bring Freddy back, to which Harlan replies, A dog pisses fire. Harlan claims that he's a dog lover, so the whole idea of magical dog pee just naturally came to him. And so, just like that, one of cinema's greatest boogeymen came back to life by the mystical power of dog piss. <laughs> Uh, well, of course, why didn't I think of that? Number 7. Robert England wasn't very enthusiastic about returning as Freddy. So, of course, it's a Freddy movie. That means we're going to need more Freddy, as well as the man behind the makeup himself, Robert England, because it just wouldn't be a Nightmare on Elm Street movie without him. However, seeing how this was now England's fourth time playing the iconic ghoul, he may have been a little burnt out with it all. But not only that, but once filming had started for A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4, England was worn out thanks to doing other acting gigs, and he just wasn't feeling it. He also originally wasn't too fond of the story and the general direction of Part 4. Emphasis on the word originally, as he did eventually change his mind and get excited about this more fun popcorn direction that the franchise was going in. Once he had seen early footage of the movie that had been cut together, he immediately got really excited and liked how the Nightmare franchise was going into a more energetic direction and was pushing capabilities with what the production was able to create on the screen. And so with that, England gave us one hell of an awesome Freddy performance in part 4. In fact, a great deal of the focus was now on Freddy, with his antics now being the main attraction, as Rennie Harlan felt that he had become the James Bond of horror movies. Only less martini drinking and more slashing teenagers, I guess. Even a UK movie poster of the movie showed Freddy in a James Bond gun barrel logo. Number 6. Out With The Old the first act of A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 is kind of mainly focused on bringing back characters that we've grown to love from the previous movie and killing them off in order to make way for new characters. Something which often divides the fan base. Once again, considering the characters were so well loved in the previous movie. First up, there's the character Kristen Parker, who was the main protagonist in part 3. Only back then, she was played by actress Patricia Arquette. However, Arquette didn't want to reprise her role for the fourth movie. Now, there are several claims as to why this happened. It's been suggested that it was over a pay dispute, but Arquette has claimed that she didn't return because she wanted to star in more challenging roles, ones that felt more meatier, you know, getting away from the horror genre. So instead, an actress called Tuesday Night took over, who was basically there to be terrorized by Freddy and then promptly killed off. Joey actor Rodney Eastman claimed that in the scene where his character and Kincaid meet up with the Kristen character at her school locker, that it was meant to be something of a heartfelt reunion. But it just didn't have that intended impact, as it didn't have Arquette in the role, and it was Arquette who they had the connection with as they had previously worked with her. In the Nightmare on Elm Street documentary, Never Sleep Again, both Eastman and Kincaid actor, Ken Segos, express how they were disappointed that their characters were just merely killed off early in the film. Eastman said that killing off their characters felt like a cheap trick, and Segos said that he told his friends that when they go to see the movie at movie theatres, don't bother buying any popcorn, because he dies very early in the movie, adding that in the script he dies as early as page 11. So what do you guys think? Was it cheap to merely kill off these characters who we grew to love in the previous film? Or are you okay with it as it keeps the mythology going and brings in new characters? Number 5. In With The New A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 introduces a new protagonist, Alice, who starts off as a shy, awkward schoolgirl, but becomes the Dream Master. Rennie Harlan explained that they wanted the character to start off as a mousy, timid girl, but then evolve into a tough Ellen Ripley-styled character. And yes, her name Alice is obviously a wink and nudge to Alice in Wonderland. 
So the big question is, who could play this new rival for Freddy? Well, apparently 600 actresses were auditioned. According to Wikipedia and IMDb, one of those actresses was Halloween 4 and 5 star Ellie Cornell. Lisa Cox, who would end up playing the part, had originally auditioned to star in A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, but her audition was unsuccessful. And at first, it seemed that her audition for part four was also unsuccessful, as she was told that she looked too much like a cheerleader and was too pretty for the part of Alice, on the account that they wanted someone who looked rough and tough. She went back to do another audition, this time with no makeup on, and in her own words, looking like hell, of which doing so would land her the role. Interestingly, she was on her honeymoon when she found out that she was cast in the part, and she had to immediately fly to Los Angeles, as well as having to dye her hair red, as not to look like Tuesday Nights, who was playing Kristen. A young actor called Dan Hassel played Alice's love interest, Dan Jordan. He said that he couldn't remember if the character was actually called Dan in the original script, but when he started filming his scenes, the crew just decided to give the character his real name of Dan. He jokingly felt that they must have thought that he was a bad actor for giving the character his real name. Number 4. Music Videos So by the time A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 came out, Freddy was now a household name and brand, a true pop cultural phenomenon. And Freddy was turning up everywhere with all kinds of Freddy merchandise, from pinball machines, to dolls, to pyjamas, to... Um, whatever the heck this is. A Fright Squirter? What the heck is a Fright Squirter? That sounds like a name you'll give someone who wets themselves when they're scared. Yep, if Freddy's burned mug could be put on something, it was. This once terrifying movie monster had now become fun for the whole family. I mean, crap on a stick. Freddy was so popular now, even Mr. Bean was going and watching his movies. <laughs> But the question is, could Freddy make it to the musical charts? Well, there were two songs used to promote A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Now, this had happened with the previous movie with the group Dokken, who released a tie-in song, Dream Warriors, and proved to be very successful. Part 4's offerings included a rap song called Are You Ready Freddy by a group called The Fat Boys, which included a musical video where the Fat Boys have to stay a night in the Elm Street house, where they get tormented by Freddy, where Freddy even comes out with his own rap. Yep, we now have Rapping Freddy. Cause you know who's back? <laughs> Freddy! Yeah, look, the whole thing is cheesy, but it's still lots of fun, and you can't help but love it, and it is something that can only exist in the 80s. The other song was called Love Kills by metal band Vinnie Vincent Invasion, which once again was accompanied by a music video, complete with clips from the movie. And yes, once again, it's very fun, and it's a bygone product of its time. Also around about this time, there was a Freddy album featuring rock and pop songs by a band called The Elm Street Group, with the songs featuring the big guy himself. I mean, how could you go wrong with songs that have titles like Do The Freddy and Down In The Boiler Room? And if you can believe it, that wasn't even the weirdest marketing associated with Freddy Krueger. Ladies and gentlemen, behold the Freddy Hotline, where you can ring up and talk to Freddy. So dial this number now if you dare. Tell him Freddy sent you. Wow, this exists. This was a thing. Two dollars the first minute, 45 cents each additional minute. Children, get your parents' permission before you dial. I am so glad that I'm not one of those weirdos who got suckered in with all that Freddy merch. <laughs> I mean, honestly, who would actually buy a Freddy Krueger pillowcase? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, just pretend you didn't see anything. Number three, deleted scene. So it's said that the shoot for A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 was a tough one, and that there wasn't much faith that the movie would be any good. It's said that producer and New Line Cinema founder Robert Shea would visit the set and would barely speak to director Rennie Harlan. He apparently was really cold towards him and wouldn't even look at him and just sort of grunted at him on the account that he had doubts that Harlan was the right guy for the job. And what also probably doesn't help is the fact that the production was running out of money. So much so, an elaborate death scene had to be scrapped where the character Rick, played by Andrus Jones, was to die in a dream elevator, which was to see the elevator crumble, where Rick falls into a never-ending dark pit. 
However, it was decided that this scene couldn't be filmed due to budget reasons. So, okay, there was then the idea of the character not dying at all. But that also couldn't be done as the character's funeral had already been shot. This is how we ended up with the scene that we got. A Freddy kill without a budget. Or a Freddy for that matter. Where the Rick character enters a cheap looking martial arts set and fights an invisible Freddy. Yep, a dramatic death scene of watching a character literally fighting thin air. But the issues didn't end there, as actor Andres Jones had recently had an operation to remove his appendix, and having to do all the fighting moves for that scene caused his scars to tear open, where he would have to be rushed to hospital. And this isn't the only oddity that occurred in trying to bring the effects of A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 to life. Or rather, afterlife. Number 2. Special Effects Quirks So for the movie's finale, it was decided to have Freddy destroyed by having the souls of his victims literally tear out of his torso from the inside out. It was decided to actually show extras pulling themselves out of Freddy's chest. So in order to achieve this effect, a giant Freddy torso was created, which could effectively show people coming out of Freddy's body. However, during one take in particular, the Freddy torso actually collapsed. One of the crew members who were supporting the top of the torso came tumbling down with the giant prop. Man, I hope she was okay, because imagine if she had to go to the hospital. How on earth is she going to explain that she was crushed by a giant Freddy torso? In the scene where Freddy kills the nerdy character of the group, Sheila, we see Freddy forcibly kiss her and literally suck the life out of her. While filming that scene, when Robert Englund kissed actress Toy Newkirk, his Freddy dentures actually came out of his mouth and went into hers. And the actress said that when that happened, she could feel all the saliva from the dentures, as well as what Englund had for lunch that day. Yuck. One of the most difficult scenes to shoot was Joey's death scene, where he was killed by way of waterbed. Apparently filming that scene was long and tiring, creating lots of tension and frustration. In fact, there is film footage of Robert Englund completely losing his shit while filming that scene. <laughs> it's hilarious. Oh, this is like 20-something takes. You guys been shooting this for six hours. If you can't get it, it's your problem. Number one, the MTV Nightmare. A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 was a massive hit to literally everyone's surprise. It made nearly $50 million in the US alone on its $6.5 million budget. It was the 19th highest grossing movie of 1988 and the highest earning a Nightmare on Elm Street movie at that time, all the way until Freddy vs. Jason in 2003. Yep, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise was now at the ultimate pinnacle of its success. And producer Robert Shea, who at first wasn't so keen on Rennie Harlan, now really appreciated the director. So much so, he offered to drive him around in his limousine one evening, so they can drive around movie theatres to see people's reactions to the movie. Where Shea even phoned up Harlan's mother in Finland and told her what a genius her son is. Well, I guess 50 mil would do that. Robert Englund would go on to call part 4, the MTV Nightmare on Elm Street, on the account that he felt that the movie is energetic and kinetic. And the title of the MTV Nightmare movie has kind of stuck ever since. And I do think that title makes sense. I mean, after all, this is the Nightmare movie where Freddy wears sunglasses on a tropical beach. <laughs> A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 is often regarded as one of the best entries in the franchise, up there with Part 1 and 3, and that it represents a time when, creatively, the series was at its best, and its craft was at the top of its range. Some even claim Part 4 to be the best in the franchise. I find the movie to be very creative and imaginative, and to generally be lots of fun. Yeah, look, I'm not the biggest fan of bringing back well-loved characters from the previous entry who survived only to very quickly kill them off. But you know what? It's only a movie, and it is still a good time. It is a very enjoyable, easy-to-digest popcorn movie that has some truly classic Freddy moments, as well as a fascinating and intriguing character in Alice. So if you want some good old scares with Freddy, then part four is the nightmare for you. Part 1 is always my favourite as it's the original. 
But I would definitely say that part four is a solid candidate for my second favorite. I would actually say it's on par with the third one and that both of them are actually my second favorite Freddy movies. I also think with A Nightmare on Elm Street part four, this time it was more about being fun and entertaining than it was being haunting and scary. It's like we already now know who Freddy is, so let's just roll with it and have some fun. And yeah, I would say that part four is more entertaining than it is scary. But I'm actually really all for this. It is without a doubt a good time. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I'm off to call the Freddy hotline. Yes, I'm going to talk to Freddy about all my problems. See ya!